Welcome to Digital Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. I'm Jeffrey. Digital Oil and Gas looks at the impact of digital technology on the global oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at jeffreycan.com. Welcome back to Digital Oil and Gas. And today I'm joined by Jim Crompton, who's the professor of practice of the Petroleum Engineering Studies Program at the Colorado School of Mines. We're going to talk about uh, questions related to uh, specifically measurement, because Jim runs a, an interesting uh, cl- a series of classes at the university about measurement. And uh, measurement's now coming to the fore as we get into questions of environmental sustainability uh, carbon tracking, uh, water tracking, and the like. And uh, it's a very important topic. So, Jim, welcome to Digital Oil and Gas. Thank you very much for having me. Now, what if you might um, just uh, unf- unfurl a little bit your uh, bit of your background, because I know your um, the the work you're doing at the university, the school, is um, uh, in addition to many other careers that you've actually had. Well, sure. Um, you know, I, I I do come to academia from a very different track. Um, uh, I spent um, 37 years with Chevron Oil Company, uh, retired in 2013, and that's when I moved up, back up here to my home in Colorado from uh, Houston, Texas, where I spent uh, among many sites for Chevron. But, you know, I'd the 37 years with an oil company is kind of unusual, but it, it allowed me to have several different careers, but just one employer. So I, I I did have a chance to see a lot of things. And that's where I got involved with this digital oil field, or as Chevron called it, the integrated oil field or I field sort of program, you know, way back 2020, uh, 2000s, I guess was the first time um, that uh, I, I kind of got involved in these things. And, um, I kind I kind of came at it from the the data plumbing guy. Yeah. So I wasn't so much the the, the programmer. I wasn't so much the uh, uh, the the emerging tech guy. But I was. So well, how do we get how do we get good data? Find good data, provide good data. So it isn't just a garbage in, garbage out kind of exercise on these things. So I was very involved in that. I've been involved in data standards. I've been involved in you know, kind of a little bit of everything. I'm not a, I'm not a deep expert in one thing. I'm a broad <laughs> familiarity with a lot of things. So that's kind of where I came from. And then uh, when we retired, um, I just kind of by chance, I was up at Colorado School of Mines. I am an alumni hmm. of this school. Um, I tell my students I graduated in 1876 and most of them believe me. Uh, <laughs> as old as dirt, as I like to say. Yeah. Um, but I was up there at a student SPE society because I knew the SPE president who was giving a talk to the group. And then I got cornered by the head of the petroleum engineering department, um, uh, Dr. Ramona Graves. Um, and Dr. you never say no to Dr. Graves when she corners you. And, uh, <laughs> and she said, Jim, we need you to develop this course. We've just putting together a a data analytics minor in the petroleum engineering uh, curriculum. Mm. And we're missing one course and we need you to develop it and teach it. So that was four years ago. And that's really how I got involved first as just a teaching faculty and then this professor of practice uh, kind of role. And so I teach a, I teach three classes now. One is a capstone course for the undergraduate data analytics minor, which I call the introduction to the digital oil field. Uh And then since the school has been very involved in um, online graduate certificate programs, I'm involved in a, uh, the petroleum engineering data analytics certificate program, not a degree. It's just four courses over two semesters online. Yep. And I developed two courses as part of that. And in the course of that, uh, that, that um, career, um, it just uh, did. did yeah, you said you you touched on multiple roles by staying with one oil company. As long as you did, you, you had a chance to see 
uh, a chunk of the industry. Uh, did it did it take you overseas at all into, into other other basins? Uh, did you work in midstream or downstream or in these other areas, or is it largely an upstream background? Well, I I was an upstream guy, so yeah. I, <clears throat> the only part about that was uh, in the corporate IT. I kind of drifted over there for a little while, but. Um, my two international assignments, one was to London, where I worked in North Sea for several years. Oh, of course, yeah. And the other international assignment was to New Orleans, where I worked <laughs> the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico for a while. <laughs> uh, New Orleans would be considered international? Uh, from a Colorado boy's perspective, it was <laughs> indeed international. Uh, it would certainly very be very... Sort of perspective, but, yeah. but in a lot of positive ways as well. <laughs> I've had the privilege of um, going to New Orleans uh, many times, and uh, it is it is different. Uh, so yeah, good for you. So let's uh, let's turn to this uh, this question of um, uh, the 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 real thing I want to get at. It, it kind of underpins our a broader theme and, and discussion about um, the emerging world of digital innovation and oil and gas. Uh, but it is that uh, the, the um, me- this whole question of measurement so that you yield good quality data. So the data analytics courses and the training, uh, very important. Uh, without the underlying measurement, the underlying data that you're trying to capture and record, uh, the, the, uh, the analytics are uh, stifled somewhat because you have to sort of sort your way through data inconsistencies. Let's just unpack that a little bit. Uh, uh, why is data um, measurement a challenge in the upstream, even today, it continues to be uh, a real, real challenge for the sector. That's a, a really important question because it data tends to get overlooked a lot uh-huh. in how um, in the whole kind of process. I mean, people love the new technology, the bright shiny new toy. They love. I mean, now we've got the case where engineers aren't allergic to programming anymore. So, you know, everybody wants to figure out how to do an artificial neural net on a Jupyter notebook with Python programming and all the subroutine calls. And I mean, so that part is now easy to teach. Mm. The part that's you have to keep reminding them of is that, that you have to have good data to make a good model. And so your, your question about why is it difficult has a lot to do with the Excuse, excuse me, the big data kind of revolution as we got around that. But people tend to mischaracterize that, in my view. Um, they tend to, when they hear the term big data, they tend to equate it to lots of data, the volume aspect. Yeah, exactly. I call it information intensity because we've got 10,000 sensors when we used to have 100 on an offshore production platform. So we got a lot of data. Uh-huh. But actually, the advances in computer science have allowed us to manage lots of data without too much trouble. And we've got the cloud computing data lakes. We've got lots of technologies that um, deal with the volumes. For me, I think the problem is the the other parts of the three or four Vs that people describe as big data. It's volume, yes, but it's variety, it's velocity, and it's veracity, data quality. And um, so it's not just we have more data. We have more different kinds of data. We have some of that data coming at us on a per second basis sample rate. And we have some of that data every year, once a year is, a, is the, the kind of refresh cycle on regard to that. And then, and because of that, we've managed that variety of data in silos within the oil and gas company. Mm. The drillers have a way of measuring their data. The reservoir folks have a way of measuring their data. The geoscience have their way of measuring their data. So we're now bringing together in a more holistic view of the asset life cycle, uh, so some of these analytical sort of studies, which is cool and it can really can great, create some very new insights into how we're, we're trying to produce. Instead of sub-optimizing the drilling performance, I am actually want to drill a well that I can complete and then I can produce for longer, right? So it blends over the different functions. Mm. But by doing that, we're now crossing different tribal languages around data. And even the concept that standards groups kind of bring out is like, what is a well? Well, that's that should be a term everybody obviously recognizes. But if you get into the details, a well to a driller is different than a well to a reservoir engineer 
which is driller uh, different to the accounting department, yeah. which is different to your permitting department. And having a common language around even some of the most important common terms is not easy to do because we haven't tried to do that before. It's not the data management people got it wrong. The data management people were doing exactly what the engineers wanted them to do. Now management's asking all of us to do something different. And we're, we struggle a bit just to, to integration. Like data integration is, um, to me, the hardest challenge. What if you kind of peel back the you, know, you used um, uh, some terms there that I find really interesting? The, you call them the four V's: volume, variety, veracity, velocity. What uh, historically what contributed to the silo behavior that um, that you see? I mean, I mean, my my model is is that we organize drillers in one group so that we get expertise happening in the driller side, but that creates this sort of tribal behavior, uh, selection of tribal based systems. Data gets trapped in the in that sort of structure. Are there other factors out there that that are driving that kind of behavior that you're seeing? Well, the the point you made about organization is kind of a really big um, uh, way that this is, plays out. Yeah. But when you look at the, that sort of organization over the years creates a culture and it creates enabling technologies. And you can all go, go all the way back to education. I mean, the academia has a role to play in all of this because we we train drilling engineers different than we train reservoir engineers. So Very true. the camps start, you know, your junior year in college. And then they are emphasized through internships and graduate studies and yep. you get hired into a company. And while some company, the larger companies will rotate your engineer around some, the one, one kind of big step forward was the, in the 1980s and 1990s, the formation of the asset teams models. And that brought geologists, uh, yeah. petrophys- petrophysicists, geophysicists, reservoir people to create a common view of the subsurface. Yeah. So, and with that, Halliburton's uh, landmark Schlumberger built software so that that common view of the subsurface would be uh, available. So we solved that part of it. So we know we can, but in that we kind of left the drillers on the outside. We left the facility and operation guys on the outside of that. Now drilling complex wells, subsalt, but we have to bring the geologist and the, with the, the geoscience and the drilling together so we can drill in the right complex well. So yeah. we made some progress in that area. And whenever there's a business driver to say, we need these functions to collaborate, then we can, then we tend to work hard to, um, to work out the language problems and work out the data interface problems, et cetera. One of the interesting ones now in this latest emphasis on the digital oil field is what I call the convergence of OT and IT where all of those systems that were developed mostly by electrical engineers, process control people for SCADA systems and, and all, the, all the rest of that, that wealth of time series data, yep. we now want that in the office. So we've had to bring the the OT systems in the field, operational technology, I meant by OT, yep. with the computer corporate IT systems that largely drive finance and Corp engineering and and things like that, and so we're we've been tackling that one for the, about the past ten or fifteen years, and with progress. And every time you we work on these things seriously, we tend to make progress. Mm-hmm. But it's still, you know, every time we fix one silo to silo problem, then management wants adds another one. So it's kind of a never ending challenge. Yeah. It's like, it's a classic, uh, classic journey problem. You have to set up for the journey because there isn't really a clearly defined uh, destination out there. And one other aspect of it is all the mergers and acquisitions. Oh yeah. So yep. That, I mean, a, a, a merger and acquisition is a, is a data manager's nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're never at the table. They're, they're never the driver for, the business arrangement, which is kind of financial or economies of scale or Uh whatever it is. And, but then you have to almost immediately, I mean, you start with finance systems, but almost immediately then you have to figure out how to converge two companies, languages, cultures, processes, 
that were probably a little bit different. And maybe they may have been 80% the same because the science is the, is the same. The engineering is the same. Yep. But that 20% can really tie you in knots. Yeah, and you've got, if, if everyone's come up through the same education structure, same education system, some of the terminology will absolutely be consistent, but it will be flavored by company. You also touched on on data as a, and you mentioned, uh, you used the term big data, not necessarily volume driven. Um, the the uh, how do how do we characterize that now? I, I think personally, there's a distinction between uh, big data and large data, and um, uh, but in in the world where you are, where you're in sort of teaching these concepts to people, how, can you unpack this whole data question a little bit around big data and large data, and, and where do, where do you see the challenges um, around just that managing the, the 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 four V's beyond silos and volume and the like? Well, I, I tackle it in trying to describe specific practical workflows that are, are industry driven. Mm. So, I mean, I, instead of doing it theoretically or academically, I really try to say, if I want to do proactive maintenance of critical equipment, what, what are the data elements? And that they usually have to cross some sort of function. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I want to talk about the rapid decline curves of unconventional wells, I need to try to talk about, all the way from the reservoir to almost the the completion to the artificial lift units, et cetera. So I tackle it in terms of obviously problem driven. Yeah, a problems to be solved. Industry yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah. And then saying because of that, you need this data from here and this data from here and this data from here. And I need it to be a smooth, nearly automated workflow at times if mm particularly when velocity comes in and safety environmentals come in, I, I want to react fast. And that's where a lot of the vol the value from the digital oil field comes from is quicker, smarter decisions. Yeah. Right? And I, and I emphasize the point, it's not the company with the most data that wins. It's the company who makes the smarter decisions because of insightful analytics that win. And I, then I also approach it one other direction and that, you know, I, I kind of said, well, where does artificial intelligence and machine learning come in? And I say, well, first of all, we know physics-based solutions, computational fluid dynamics and reservoir characterizations, something we've been doing for decades. Decades, yeah, classic models. Yeah. Statistical-based approaches, the decline curve analysis, uh, the ARPS equation, the hyperbolic decline curve sort of things, using just classic statistics we've been using for decades. That's not new. Yeah. But now we've, we're trying to tackle some problems where we don't really understand the physics real well. We may have constraints, the rest of it, but I don't have a law to de determine, you know, decline curve when you're going from fracture-based porosity to matrix-based porosity in a well. Yeah. But I have a lot of data. When we've drilled hundreds of thousands of wells, and now I've got a, a processing technique, machine learning, where I can be data driven. I may not know why, but the data comes up with a correlation, uh, and and I can feed lots of data to it quickly, and it'll produces if I train it well. And that's yeah. back to the data quality that that I now have this third set of uh, tools, and that's the modern machine learning sort of programming techniques. And now, I mean, I I make the joke that. Ten years ago, Python was a snake, R was a letter, and Amazon was a river. But now those are programming languages. And and now petroleum engineers graduate with some knowledge of these scripting, low-code programming languages. Yeah. And they're not afraid of that. They're they Actually, it's kind of uh, cool to, to be able to do that. So I'd say don't throw away the physics when it works. Don't throw away the statistics when it works. Yeah. Keep it simple. But we're now getting into problems where those don't work so well. And we now have another set of tools to yeah. tackle a new set of problems. But I guess the long, long answer to your, your question was begin with a, an, a practical industry based problem in mind. And work from there, yeah. I think that is the essence of it. Um, uh, it's very easy to, when you get into the staring at data uh, is and um, the sources of data is to try and fix everything all at once before you even start doing any of the analytics uh, on it. And that's, that's a recipe for uh, uh, very, very poor returns um, because it takes, there's no end to making your data clean or, or, or better, I suspect. 
my my students get really bored with me because I I almost constantly quote a English statistician by the name of Edward Box who said all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, <laughs> all, all all the models we ever produce are going to be wrong. They will not be precisely correct. Yeah, we can't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good, and and the good is defined by can you make a better decision. Yeah, let's turn to it. All your data right. Yeah, let, let's turn back to because where uh, still this comes conversation reverses back to the question of data sources and how you ma- actually measure things so that you get good quality data. Um, because all, as you point out, if you, uh, garbage in, garbage out, and if you don't have a, a solid data founding, your your models are going to be not only wrong, but much worse wrong than they would be if you had good quality data, given that all models are probably wrong to some degree. Let's go back to the the, the data collection, the data source problem that's that's out in the field. Uh, what's what's uh, how would you characterize the 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 uh, challenges of actually collecting that data? I mean, just just because you can put ten thousand sensors on a on a facility uh, does not mean you're going to be able to successfully collect reliable data. What, what what's blocking progress there? Uh, almost at every step, there is kind of pros and cons with regard to that. You know, I mean, mm. at the sensor stage. Yes, the sensors are cheap enough. They're better rugged enough. You can put them down hole near the sand face. You can you, you can put 10,000 sensors on a, on a production facility mm-hmm. and it won't break your capital budget on your on your project. So they're yeah. affordable. They are, there's a lot, the sensors could uh, do a lot more than just pressure and temperature. There's a lot more that they can do. So on the, yep. the tremendous Moore's loss, tra- uh, uh, miniaturization of transistors, all the rest of that kind of trend is we got better sensors. Now, in the first, uh, well, first problem there is the sensors are noisy. And we, we tend to have issues with some of these, particularly in the drilling side of things. Uh, the drilling sensors are terrible with regard to noise, signal to noise ratio. Uh. So usually we fix that by having more sensors, right? And then doing some sort of, um, uh, uh signal processing kind of games with it to reduce uh take the noise and, out. and, and, and yeah. take care of missing data or yeah. filtering out outliers that are aren't practical and things like that so data sensor data noise quality is, is problem number one hmm. we have ways of dealing with that problem number two is how do i get the data from the field to the office or something like i mean the positive side is you have cloud computing so we we don't have to send it through some private uh, telecom network to our yep. data center. Most companies don't even have data centers anymore. They, yeah. they, it's the cloud. I mean, the cloud, our yeah. data centers belong to Microsoft and Amazon and IBM and Google and people like that. And so that allows us uh, uh, some better ways. Uh, wireless technologies. I mean, everybody talks about 5G on the on the TV commercials, but most oil field people would love to have 3G. I mean, <laughs> so it, it is farther behind that ability to move lots of data is still a a challenge and it's a cost. Uh-huh. Uh, it's less of a cost than people think at times, but th- you can't move all your data. I mean, the, the studies have shown that even if you got 10,000 sensors out there, you probably move less than 5% of it to the office. Uh, so you, we are not using most of the data we have. Now the advances there is the whole idea of edge computing, internet of things, we don't have to move all the data. We can actually move some of the processing to yeah, the field, to the edge, yeah, to the smart equipment. Yep. And then all of a sudden, we can move. We can use that data once we build a model for it to run to say this is how you predict the future and do what's called management by exception. It's, you know, how does the measured value com- compare with the estimated calculated value, and then learn off of that or make decisions off of that. Then, you know, that, that sort of concept that we now don't have to move all the data again. So that's a big issue of Internet, what I call digital oil field 2.0 is digital oil field 1.0 was gathering a whole bunch of data. 2.0 now is connecting them, is the connections about it. And mm. even recognizing we don't have to move all of that data for it to be useful with edge computing kind of techniques. Data quality, again, there's a, an issue that frequently within company cultures, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about safety culture, building a safety culture in our industry. Mm-hmm. 
we need to build a data culture in our industry, which we have not done. Yeah. Frequently, the people responsible for acquiring the data aren't the ones who use it. So therefore, they don't have that incentive to improve it because we just collect it and somebody else does something with it, right? That, that negative, the, we talk about data as an enterprise asset. That phrase is thrown about in C-suites a lot. But, you know, most management really kind of interpret that as being, I'll buy the latest new technology for my group and they'll they'll fig- figure it out. Yeah. And so there are very few effective and influential chief data officers who are really looking over and have the responsibility and governance, that magic word, governance over data. We have governance over money. We have governance over legal assets. We have governance over physical assets. We have uh, rather, the industry has rather weak governance over data. Over data assets, yeah. I think that's a consistent theme I hear uh, uh, regularly with on the podcast is that um, the this uh, data culture is not yet emerged um, to a, a degree that you would think it should be in place, considering how sensitive the industry is to its its actual data. Um, and uh, so, so we sketched out the problem. We we uh, we have noisy sensors. We um, struggle to get the data back to the home office. We don't bring all the data back, and we process it through Edge. Our culture doesn't really create the right incentive structure for uh, people in the field to 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 really look at the data through the lens of a, a sort of a quality lens. Where does where does cyber issues sort of fit into all of this? Because uh, you know, I think there's a, a worry out there with um, amongst some executives that uh, the more you open up your infrastructure through these sensors and connectivity, you actually expose yourself to cyber threats. Is that is that something that is still worrisome or, or is that really a, a, a problem that is overblown? No, I mean, you should ask Colonial Pipeline. <laughs> they will tell yeah. you that it's not overblown. Um you know, my my phrase with Digital Oilfield 2.0 is the good news is we're connected and the bad news is we're connected. <laughs> um, and yeah. uh, security hasn't been built in. It hasn't been designed in. It's just kind of the engineer says, I need this data. So the IT puts another pinhole in the server and you feed the data out. And so I, I clearly think cybersecurity in the digital oil field is a serious issue. We We hear about occasionally about some of these incidents when they become as public as colonial pipeline. Mm. Um, but most of the time, the industry obviously don't want to talk about that a whole lot. Um, I do give a lecture um, uh, on cybersecurity in the digital oil field, both physical and cybersecurity in the digital oil field. And I mean, every time I give the lecture, I, there's a new example to try to talk about. Mm. Pipelines seem exceptional, uh, exceptionally vulnerable. I just, they have too many connections and both financial and operational sides of things. Mm. Um, and so you hear a lot about pipeline incidents, but at the same time I had a um, guest speaker on uh, from a drilling company. I won't mention their names, but um, they came about and said one of their most modern digital rigs that was had tremendous connectivity to their central decision support center was down for two days due to a denial of service attack. From on a, somebody on a drilling rig, off, I think, um, <laughs> and just seeing if they could do that. Then they lost two days of non-productive time due to their servers were 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 hacked and wouldn't respond. Yeah. So it's worse than most people think because mostly we don't talk about it. Yeah. The the interconnectivity is, which is a good thing, which we're not going to stop, is also creates the holes, the back doors, the uh, you know problems and. Again, it's every all it takes is some knucklehead getting an email and clicking on an attachment they shouldn't, and bingo, you've got a, a malware virus that's uh, in your system. And unfortunately, that still happens a lot. Well, I guess one of the things, Mines is the Colorado School of Mines IT department. They run these fishing, ethical fishing expeditions on their own staff. Yep. And I know my, my department had got caught, and I got caught, you know, a couple uh, months ago clicking on the wrong emails. And so I have to go back to class and I have to remind myself <laughs> of what are the right practices and 
and what and when not to uh, click on some of these things. So it's it's so easy. The good guys are working hard to correct it. The bad guys are ahead of us on this because stuff. they just have to be right once, and the good guys have to be right all the time. Yeah. It's a really interesting uh, and sadly uh, um, uh, a, a, a story about uh, targeting a, uh, a rig. Uh, pipelines make sense to me because they're a pinch point. And, um, uh, you know, if you're going to uh, – I remember watching Greenpeace uh, go after oil fields in northern Alberta, uh, the oil sands mines. And uh, there's too many mines to kind of tackle. But if you can, if you can actually get out a pipeline, um, you can you can knock out all the oil fields because there's no place for the oil to go. So it's it's a much more disruptive place to target, and it explains a lot about pipeline politics now and pipeline activism, et cetera, et cetera. Suffice to say, we have a whole conversation on pipelines uh, <laughs> and their challenges. Um, getting back, though, to, to, to measurement, what, what do you see on the future as um, possible um, solutions to the challenge of field data measurement? Are we seeing, say, for instance, a reduction in noisy, noise levels in sensors? Um, it's, I mean, this hall can't be just throw more data up into the cloud and it'll get solved. There's got to be more to it than that. Well, I'm, I think at every level there are, there's opportunities and, and good pr- activities going on. I mean, mm. it, uh, w- sensors are getting more rugged and then they're knocking down the noise. We're putting them in the right places. Uh, in some cases that are inherently noisy, we could do it with a network of four or five sensors and then use the the power of a, of a small network over a single measurement point yep. that really tends to improve signal and noise. <clears throat> As I said, with edge computing, IOT devices or IIOT devices, if you will, uh, industrial internet of things devices, we uh, don't have to move as much data. So therefore the challenge on the tra- telecommunications is less. Yep. I, I think we are more aware of um well, I mean, you, you can't protect everything and you don't need to protect everything. There's just a certain amount of data that really should have the highest um, level of focus and in on encryption and things like that if you want to do that. But there's a lot of data that we just need to understand. Actually, and this is something that OT networks haven't really done. The uh, This is where IT lesson learned to the OT department. The, the IT department are, are starting to get used to understanding the behavior on that system, not just intrusion detection or edge or um, defense at the edge or th- techniques like that. But they're used to looking at the behavior behavior. And when a system starts to behave funny, they're, they, they recognize that an OT, they haven't done that. We haven't looked at behavior of SCADA systems. It's yeah. just whether it's the, the, whether the sensor is plugged in or not, the PLC is working or not, the rest of that. Both sides are now to the point where they're friends. I mean, it took, it took about a decade to build a friendship between those two groups. So the IT to people keeping wanting to, well, it's Thursday evening. We're going to take all the servers offline to run our, our upgrades. And the <laughs> OT people going nuts saying, you can't do that. You're yeah. going to shut down my systems. Yeah. So or so the, the whole idea of change management was the first issue where the OT and IT had to come to an agreement. Now they're friends. Now they understand that they need each other. Now they're understanding the sharing the IT people can't just shut the OT systems off. The OT people have to learn change management practices and it be in behavior, process behavior mm-hmm. from the IT folks. And and so at least for the big companies, it's better. I mean, you, you, it's the big companies that you hear the, the bad headlines about. I'm more worried about legacy. Mm-hmm. I mean, not everybody puts the most modern systems on. Um, every guy, the phrase I use, everybody changes their smartphones every year, but we don't change our SCADA systems every 20 years. Yeah. So there's the, the vulnerability sits in our legacy in the oil field. And we've got a lot of legacy yep. and most of that legacy is being handed off from very large capable companies to companies less so. Oh, yeah, that's actually an interesting angle, too. I hadn't thought about that. I know that, I mean, I've, I've often argued that something like 85% of all of our oil infrastructure predates the internet. Like, why would we think it would be able to withstand a concerted attack effort, for instance? Or why would we think it would have the sophistication to do the kinds of data collection and analytics or cloud access or even network access 
Uh, it, it was uh, never designed to do that. Never yet. designed for that. We yeah. figured out a way to plug it in anyway. Yeah. Because some engineer at the office wanted to see that data. Good to see the data. Jim, this has been very uh, interesting first conversation. We're going to absolutely have a second one because I'm very interested in, in now that we've kind of unpacked the the whole world of measurement data and uh, the a, where the industry is at today, uh, the next conversation we'll have will be on analytics. Like what, you know, let's, let's talk about that engineer with who, who now knows our Python and works with Amazon. Uh, what, what does that world actually look like? So we will, we'll diarize that for a future call. It, it sounds great. I mean, it, we all are in a kind of a re-education of kind of phase, myself included. I mean, I, I didn't, the stuff I'm teaching today, I didn't do 10 years ago. So I'm, I'm constantly having to learn, <laughs> working with the university, working with these kind of online outreach programs, working with uh, companies like Top Energy who help try to reach out and offer, um, you know, some of these processes to people that, in the, that have been got 10 years experience. I mean, I'm less worried about the student that just graduates who has this higher degree of digital literacy. Yeah than I am the majority of the engineers who have 10, 15 years experience, but none in this space. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's that 45 year old, um, you know, solid 20 years now and uh, the world is racing on up to them. Uh, and don't this, forget them. They're an important part of the industry. Very important. Jim, thank you again for coming on the podcast today. Very uh, uh, welcome. And uh, I enjoyed the conversation. Uh, this has been another episode of Digital Oil and Gas today on this question of um, data and measurement in a lead up to a second conversation on analytics. And if you like what you've heard, please press the like button or leave a comment. Jim and I will get back to you or uh, better yet, share this with your network so that others can discover this podcast. And I'll return in a week's time with another episode. Bye for now. 